Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Baha'i Blogcast listeners, it's me, Rain, and a very exciting guest, a scintillating guest from across the pond, as they say. We've got Rob Weinberg tuning in from the United Kingdom. Rob is a Baha'i I've been wanting to speak to for a long time, a radio producer, podcast producer, an author of many books, and a terrific speaker. Apparently, we met once at the Baha'i International Center. Is that right, Rob? Yes, it must have been about 2010. We passed very briefly and were introduced, shook hands, which you can't do these days, and... uh, went our way. So you probably don't remember. I don't remember, but I'm so glad that we did meet there. And I'm really excited to talk to you. You know, we're celebrating the centenary of the passing of Abdul Baha, which is a kind of spiritually supercharged year and time. And you've provided a book. So before we get to your personal story, which I would love to know a little more about and get to know you a little bit, I want to just dig right in from the get-go about Ambassador to Humanity. Can you tell us about this book and what inspired you to put it together? Well, I've always been very interested in the way that the central figures of the faith have been perceived by others, and not necessarily people who were devotees or followers or knew anything about the new religion when it started and Mm. when it came to the West, I was always curious about how people perceived the Bab and Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. And of course, in the case of Baha'u'llah, we have very little in English. The only pen description of Baha'u'llah is of Professor Brown Mm. from Cambridge University. Before Baha'u'llah with the Bab, there was a lot of contemporary writing about the Bab although there are very few Westerners who came into contact with him. Mm. I can think of the doctor, the Irish doctor, Dr. Cormick, who treated the barb and left a description of that. But the story of the barb went round the world. It was reported in all the newspapers of the day. It was very well known. In fact, there's one description uh, which writes about the barb and says, of whom the whole of the country is aware of the name. Mm. I just thought that was extraordinary that the whole of Britain at that time would be aware of the name of the Barb. But it was very well covered, especially the persecution of the early Barbies. Mm. And so in 2019, which was the bicentenary of the birth of the Barb, I decided to pull together a book of pen portraits and tributes and testimonials to the Barb including those made by Baha'u'llah, by Abdul Baha, by Shoghi Effendi, and by the House of Justice, Mm -hmm. but also some of those contemporary reports from newspapers of the time and other people that encountered the Barb, or described the Barb at least in their own writings. And what's the name of that book again? That book's called The Primal Points. Okay. Um, So then when I saw that the centenary of Abdul Baha's passing was coming up, I thought, well, I should do the same again for Abdul Baha. And then lockdown happened and we were all stuck in our homes and it was ideal. So shortly after the fast last year, I spent probably about six weeks, maybe to two months, just immersed in everything I could find about Abdul Baha, all the books that I have here in my own flat, but also anything I could find online. And I also wrote to the Baha'i World Center and they pointed me in the right direction for accounts, because I wanted not only to have accounts of Abdul Baha in the West, which there are plenty of resources uh, to find stories and uh, tributes to Mm -hmm. Abdul Baha in those books, but I wanted those elements also that covered his early years in Iran, his time in Baghdad, his time in Adrianople, his time in Acre, so that we got a picture of Abdul Baha that wasn't just the three or four years when he was traveling, but which encompassed the full span of his life. And as I was putting them together, I thought, well, 
actually, I could probably tell the story of Abdul Baha's life chronologically through the eyes of those that met him. Mm. So that formed the structure of the book. And it was just a wonderful experience, actually, because the fast had finished. But when you're in, when you're deeply immersed in a project like that, and you're just reading about Abdul Baha every day, and you're encountering him in all of these different descriptions from all the different people that met him, you feel like you're there. You become part of that world. Mm. So there was a sort of wonderful feeling that the fast was continuing for another two months. And uh, I was able to finish it during the first lockdown. And luckily I did because things have got busier again now. And uh, I don't think I would have had the time to do it. Oh, wow. What a, what a bounty then. That's, that's, that's fantastic. What, what are some things you were surprised to learn in the making of this book? I think the thing that came across the most was, you know, when we look at someone's life, when someone passes away, the newspapers print obituaries, and people are usually remembered for one thing, for one invention, for one achievement, for that time they won the gold medal at the Olympics, right. or that great painting they did, or just most people are capable of one extraordinary achievement in their life mm -hmm. or a series of achievements in the same vein. But when you look at Abdul Baha, he was really the master of everything. He was the master of social action. He cared for people. For 40 years, he was in Akka, and his life consisted mm -hmm. of visiting people, visiting the sick, helping the poor, tending to the needs of the people around him in his own neighborhood, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. He, during the First World War, supervised the collection of grain so that he could feed the whole population in the north of Palestine who were facing famine. So you have this master of social action. He was not only doing it at home, he was directing communities in Iran to build public baths, to improve their health, to improve their education. He was coordinating American women teachers and doctors to go to Iran and teach people there how to look after themselves. Mm. Then you get into this realm of public discourse. He was such a profound thinker on all of the issues of the day. So when you see him come to the West, he's on top of the issue of women's rights. Mm. He's on top of the issue of race. He's talking about the extremes of wealth and poverty. He's addressing letters to The Hague, where peace conferences were taking place after the First World War. So he was a profound commentator, really, on the state of the world and what was required to alleviate the suffering of humanity. I just interviewed uh, Catherine Hoganson, also author and historian and just terrific speaker. And, and she had mentioned like how up to date Abdul Baha was on world current events like he could speak to kind of anything that was going on in the world and if he famously would read I mean there weren't newspapers accessible to him and like there were in the days of Shoghi Effendi who off who would also spend you know a good chunk of time of his morning kind of catching up on in world affairs why do you think that's important for our illustrious holy acclaimed, amazing spiritual leaders to kind of be aware of world events? Well, it's a fundamental teaching of Baha'u'llah that we should be anxiously concerned with the ah. needs and problems of the times we live in. Yeah, That's why Baha'u'llah came. He came to bring a prescription. He describes himself as this divine physician who's mm -hmm. diagnosed the ill health of humanity and prescribed the remedy. And it's extraordinary also that Abdul Baha, in old age, after a lifetime of imprisonment and exile and banishment, that the first thing he thinks of when he's released is not to put his feet up and mm -hmm. enjoy some comforts, but to actually make that journey to the West to proclaim the faith and to proclaim those teachings as the remedy that the world needs. And of course, the world was on the brink of the First World War at that point, right. and he could see it. He knew exactly what was going on, and his mission really was a peace mission, I would say, especially when he 
is in France, when he's in Britain, when he's in America, he's warning humanity of what's to come. Mm. So he's very conscious of that. There's a very interesting talk he gives when he's in Paris. And there'd been some train accident in Paris or in France, and a small number of people had died, sadly. But he says, I can't understand why everybody is so upset about this handful of people when hundreds, thousands of people are dying all over the world every day. And if we truly see ourselves as one humanity, as one human family, we should be crying for all of those people and not being so uh, upset about what's happening on our own doorstep. So his vision was incredibly world embracing. But just on the point you and made. That, and that and that same thing just continues to this day. You know, sadly, there, there'll be some terrible accident that happens here in the United States and several are injured and one or two killed or something like that. And at the same time, there'll be some massive earthquake with hundreds of thousands dead on the other side of the world. And you, you can barely find a, a headline about it. So we're still so just kind of focused on our own doorstep, as you said. Yes, we are quite parochial in our thinking. And actually, I started out my career in local radio. And it was very interesting. I remember New Year's Eve 1989 going into 1990. And I presented a phone in discussion on what are your hopes for the new decade? What are the things that you'd like to see happen in the world? And, you know, people find it very hard to see beyond the state of the paving in their town or street lighting. Mm. And uh, I actually asked some of the Baha'is to call in and they were saying, I'd like to see a peace conference. I'd like to see all the nations of the world coming together. And <laughs> you, sta you stacked peace. the calls. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and yet, you know, when, when there is something on our own doorstep, we get very upset about it because it has a direct impact on our lives but we fail to see that actually everything has a direct impact on our lives. The suffering of people in one part of the world uh, is the same. We should have the same concern about them that we do for the people on our street. So, of course, we have to act locally and we have to care for people around us. But I think it's that world-embracing vision that Abdu'l-Bahá had. And this extraordinary superhuman knowledge, really, I found... One of the passages I found, which I thought was very illuminating, came from a missionary. It was a Christian missionary who was in the Holy Land, who meets Abdu'l-Bahá. And he says, we had a long interview with the son of the prophet. It was indeed strange to find an Eastern in Syria so well educated and to hear him speak so tolerantly and intelligibly of Christ and Christianity. So there's a kind of very sort of patronizing yeah. comment from, yeah. on the part of this person. You know, oh, there's an Easterner. Oh, how intelligent and well-educated he, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he is. Mean, I, I meanwhile, that. <laughs> meanwhile, Lebanon and Syria is are filled with hundreds of thousands of Christians, you know, very well-educated Christians oh. who can speak on Christianity, who are Middle Easterners. That And so that shows the author's ignorance as well. <laughs> yes. And I think the other thing is, you know, Abdu'l-Bahá was so well-loved and well-received by leaders of thought and people in authority and some of the most progressive thinkers in the Middle East were seeking him out and were his friends and were going to him for advice. Certainly after the First World War, when the British were in Palestine, General Allenby and various leading lights of the British mandate there were calling on him for, their, for his advice. So he was highly thought of. And you can see that in his funeral the speeches that were given in his funeral, many of which I've put in the book, mm. were not Baha'is. They were leading Jewish thinkers, Muslims, Christians, Druze, poets, local activists. The people paying tribute at his funeral were the people of Haifa and Akka. And they were all weeping along with the immediate family and the followers. Wow. Well, I have brought this up before on the podcast and in previous episodes, and it's something that I've spoken about a lot. And I think that Baha'is kind of get into, um, misconstrue uh, following in the example of Abdu'l-Bahá, because there's there's so many ways to follow in the example of, of Abdu'l-Bahá. And certainly, 
emulating his spiritual qualities, his kindness and his love and his compassion, which is an almost impossible task, but nonetheless, we we strive to do that. And certainly his erudition in terms of his knowledge and study of the Baha'i faith is, is unsurpassed. And that's all, that's all well and good. But this, this whole concept that you just spoke to that really ignites my heart, which is, you know, what was he doing for 40 years in Akka? What did, what did the average day of Abdul Baha look like when he was quote unquote imprisoned? It was a constant community activism for lack of a better word, whether it's in, you know, food distribution, wealth distribution, helping the poor, education. And then you you talked about the social discourses he was engaged in, these constant, quote unquote, elevated discussions that the Universal House of Justice has asked all of us to engage in, in our communities, whatever they are, or communities that we create. So that's the the aspect of the, uh, of the example of Abdul Baha that I really wish for all Baha'is to, in their communities, you know, like like you said, be anxious of the needs of your time and looking around the communities, where does the community need help? How can I give my time and energy to, to serving this community and engaging in social discourses with this community, which can be an online community as well. It doesn't have to be, you know, your your suburb or, or, or what have you, but this is an aspect I feel sometimes for, you know, and forgive me for being, I'm not meaning to be critical, but I do feel like growing up in the Baha'i faith myself, it's something I didn't see in the 70s and 80s. I didn't see Baha'is. I saw them on assemblies and going to holy days and praying and and doing wonderful things, singing songs, but I didn't see Baha'is socially active in their communities and engaging in these social discourses. Any thoughts? I think it's interesting that Baha'u'llah had said that it wasn't permissible to teach the Baha'i faith in the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. When they arrived as prisoners, he said, this isn't a place for teaching. So Abdu'l Baha did all of those things without even mentioning Mm -hmm. the teachings of the faith. Mm -hmm. He had to live fully the Baha'i life and in that sense, he also became an example to the people around him. He was an example of the Baha'i faith and what it stood for. They knew him as a wise man and a holy man, but mainly they knew him as the father of the poor, the person they could turn to when they had problems, when a family member was ill, when they couldn't afford to pay for a funeral, when they were cold, he would give them his coats. You know, these were the kinds of exemplary activities that he was engaged in. And I think the plans of the House of Justice are making us focus locally, focusing on our own neighbourhoods. And interestingly, I think in the last year, when so many of us have been stuck at home, I've lived in my flat here for 17 years, but I've spent more time in the last year in this flat than I did in the previous 16 years, Mm. because I was flying all over the place and going to London every day to work and getting away at weekends and going to activities and conferences and traveling in different parts of the world. And suddenly I'm thinking, I've lived here all this time. I don't really know people. I don't know what the issues are. I don't know what local Mm. people are concerned about. And it's only been in the last six months, really, when I've felt actually it's time to really engage locally. And I've been doing some newsroom shifts again. And Really, there's no better place to find out what the discourse of the day is. Mm. You really hear what people are talking about, what the concerns are. And when I become aware of the high levels of crime and problems involving young people in my own town, which I wasn't even aware of, the levels of drug use, the levels of violence, gangs, all of these things going on. And I'm thinking, what is it that's going to actually change the reality for these young people, if not the children's programs and the junior youth spiritual empowerment program Mm. and all the things that we're meant to be doing, because they're not going to get it from any other source. And the solution that is proposed here locally is let's put more police into the neighborhoods so that there's a presence. People won't commit crimes if they see police walking around. But that doesn't change people. That doesn't change attitudes. That doesn't change 
the way they think about the person next door or Doesn't the kid on the other hearts. side of the street. Yeah. yeah. So so you can see that everything we're doing in the plans of the House of Justice is really just a continuation of the work of Abdul Baha. And in that sense, he's the example for all time because what he was doing in his own neighborhood, while at the same time having this world embracing vision and being well informed mm. and contributing not only to conversations locally, but also to the big international issues of the day, the entire Baha'i world community now is really a reflection of Abdul Baha. He had all of that all in one person, which is what makes him really extraordinary. Now, you mentioned some of his travels to places that weren't the United States and, in your case, the UK. Do you have any stories about Abdul Baha in some in places like Egypt or some of the other uh, places he went to that we don't really get to hear that much about. I mean, he spent a good amount of time in Egypt. It's the first place he went to when he got out of the Holy Land. And yet I really don't know anything about about that that trip or what he did. Well, he went to Egypt really as the first port of court with the intention of going further. But he stayed a year actually in Egypt before taking the boat to France and the first leg of his tour. And then after he was in France and England the first time, he then went back to Egypt before he took the trip to America. Mm. And then finally, after the journey in America and back through England and France, and then he visited uh, Austria, Vienna, Hungary, Germany, he then went back to Egypt again before going back to Haifa. So he probably spent more time in Egypt, actually, outside of the Holy Land than any other place. Mm. And it was very interesting because the press in Egypt was very anti the Baha'i faith, had all sorts of misconceptions and ideas about the Baha'i faith, which were erroneous. And almost as soon as Abdul Baha got there, he was receiving visits from newspaper editors and journalists and leading thinkers of the day. And everything changed. It completely changed the attitudes of the people and the popular attitude to the faith because of Abdul mm. Baha's personality. And so there are accounts um, of his time in Egypt. In fact, there was a whole book published quite a long time ago called Abdul Baha in Egypt, uh, which is a sort of day to day account of his activities. So one of the examples is from an Egyptian newspaper, Mohamed. And the journalist writes, whoever associates with him, find him a man who has information upon all subjects of human interest. His words are eloquent and attract the hearts and enkindle the souls. His teachings and conversation revolve around the center of the greatest of the world's problems to remove entirely religious, racial and patriotic prejudices and lay the foundation of a brotherhood and unity that will last throughout the ages and eternity. So that's a journalist who comes into contact with Abdul Baha wow. yeah. and the kind of thing he's publishing in an Egyptian newspaper. And one of the accounts comes from someone called Muhammad Yazdi. He says, you think that if he should come to America, you must have a house prepared and surround him with luxuries of modern civilization. Far from it, with love, unity and harmony shining like stars of heaven, a little cottage is greater than the imperial palace of kings. All through his life, his sole purpose and aim is to spread the fragrances of God, to serve the kingdom of Abba, and to sacrifice himself for the good of the world. His life, like unto a tempestuous sea, is ever in motion, casting pearls of significance and truth upon its shore. Humanity owes to him a debt that can never be paid with money or gratitude. Wow. So you get the sense of the kind of impact he was making on Egypt. Mm. And... Then when he comes to London, the press coverage and the reception he gets was phenomenal. And he's welcomed at the most prominent church, St. John's Westminster. Mm. He's welcomed at the city temple. He gives the first public speech of his entire life from the pulpit of the city temple in London. Yeah, that's that's to... that's, that's remarkable that you would say mm. that, because I hadn't even thought about that. If he's not teaching the faith and in the Holy Land, and then he's going to Egypt uh, on his way, and then makes his way to to England. This was his first real public mm. 
talk. What did he talk about at Abdul Baha's very first public speech? He talks about the unity of humanity and the day of God. He says, today the light of truth is shining upon the world in its abundance. This is a new cycle of human power. All the horizons of the world are luminous and the world will become indeed as a garden and a paradise. It is the hour of unity of the sons of men and of the drawing together of all races and all classes. And then he says, the gift of God to this enlightened age is the knowledge of the oneness of mankind and of the fundamental oneness of religion. War shall cease between nations and by the will of God, the most great peace shall come. The world will be seen as a new world and all men will live as brothers. And this is to a congregation of about two or 3,000 people. Mm. It was the most popular church in London. The pastor in charge was called the Reverend R.J. Campbell, and he was quite a radical Christian, very visionary. And he was very keen to open the doors of the church wider to all sorts of people. It's quite an extraordinary thing at that time for a Christian church to say, mm. Here's a man from the East. He's visiting London. Let's not only welcome him to our church, but enable him to give a speech to the congregation. Mm. So you get this mm. um, sense of Abdul Baha's celebrity, if you like. But very interestingly, he is not the first Eastern teacher, if you like, to come to the West. Mm -hmm. There were others. But he's the first to talk about the equality of men and women. He's the first to talk about race unity. And he's the first not to ask for money. <laughs> All of the others <laughs> were trying to raise funds mm. to support themselves, to support their mission, and also to establish their own various communities in the West. And Abdul Baha didn't accept a penny from anyone. There are so many stories of people giving him expensive gifts and him just looking at them, saying, thank you very much. I enjoyed that very much. Now go and sell it and give the money to the poor. <laughs> he, he didn't want to receive money. And even, as you probably know, the American friends bought him a ticket on the Titanic. Mm. He was going to come to America on the maiden voyage of the Titanic. And he felt that that was kind of too ostentatious. He'd rather go on a lesser ship. Mm. And, uh, and of course, we know what happened to the Titanic. So he may have had some kind of inkling that something was not quite right there. Uh, but nevertheless, the main reason for him saying no to that mm. was because he wanted the money to be better spent. Right. So, so again, that's through his example. He was so frugal and so modest and so unaccustomed to great, you know, meals and mm. banquets mm. and things like that. Well, so it, many stories of him just... It's so funny that you sorry. bring up the Titanic because Baha'is bring up that story a lot. And, you know, yeah. and I was just thinking in my head as you were talking about it, how the Titanic is was a symbol of the age because the ostentatiousness... Is that a word? Austin, ostentation. Ostentation, thank you. <laughs> I think of so. Of the wealthy classes, you know, doing their waltzes and dining on lobsters in the upper decks and the, you know, and the poor you know, down in the in the hovels down below, down next to the uh, uh, the steam engines, the coal engines, which, you know, obviously I'm, I'm drawing on my rich knowledge of the Titanic from the movie that I saw three or four <laughs> times. But but when you think about it, it is that that symbol of like of this w income inequality and wealth disparity and class ism. And it was all contained in that ship. So it was like. There was a, you know, the Onion magazine, that satirical U.S. Uh, comedy magazine. They, I remember they had a headline once. It's like, uh, Titanic, world's greatest metaphor, hits iceberg or something like that. It was something to that extent. And, um, but really, that's what he was rejecting, uh, I imagine. I imagine. And the thing is that this was a period of great hope. The 20th century began with great optimism and hope. It was a new century. Technology was beginning to flourish. There was relative peace all over Europe. Mm -hmm. And then two things happened, which completely shattered that optimism. And the sinking of the Titanic was one of them. The First World War was the other. Mm -hmm. People saw in the Titanic a symbol also of progress, of 
you know, technology, a ship that couldn't be sunk. And guess what? On its maiden voyage, it sank. Mm -hmm. And I think on a kind of spiritual level as well, it really shocked people to the core that all of the kind of hope and optimism that came with the coming of the new century went down in the North Atlantic. So it was a very powerful metaphor and it was a very shocking event, which the 20th century didn't really recover from. You know, it was a century of constant turmoil mm. and war and huge problems emerging. But of course, as Baha'is, we know that it's the coming of the manifestation of God, which actually sets in motion those processes mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. integration and disintegration. And Baha'u'llah offered the kings and rulers of his time this opportunity to establish peace and meet all the needs of their subjects in order to establish this peace. And he said to them, if you reject this most great peace, then you'll have to settle for second best. Mm. I'm paraphrasing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the lesser peace and the situation in the world will get so dark, so bad, the problems will become so intense, so insurmountable that you will be forced to unite. It's very interesting even now, I'm hearing so many speakers and thinkers and politicians who are saying the same sorts of things. Mm. The former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Gordon Brown, has just written a book called Seven Ways to Change the World. And his conclusion is that nationalism has failed. And that when you look at climate change, when you look at the problems in the world, be it terrorism or pandemics or the disparity of the rich and poor, the only way that you can deal with that is internationally, globally. Mm -hmm. um, and the, this whole principle of nationalism, which we've seen rear its head again in recent years, is defunct. It's so out of date and it's so incapable of meeting the problems of the world. So Abdu'l-Bahá could see that. Baha'u'lláh obviously could see that. Um, and that was the message that Abdu'l-Bahá was bringing. And people were impressed by him and taken by him and moved by his presentations. But sure enough, within two years of him being in the United States, the world was at war again. Yeah. And it was the most devastating war that humanity had ever experienced. The war to end all wars? Not really. And why do you call the book Ambassador to Humanity? It's a phrase that I saw in a book called The Reconciliation of Races and Religions. And that was written by a theologian at Oxford University called T.K. Shane. And he calls one of the chapters in his book, Ambassador to Humanity. Mm. And I just thought it was such a lovely title. I mean, there are so many titles for Abdu'l-Bahá. He was Abdu'l-Bahá, obviously. His real name was Abbas Effendi. Mm -hmm. He was known as the Mystery of God. He was known as the Master. But this phrase of an ambassador, actually the Latin word from which ambassador is derived, ambactus means servant. So it's very appropriate mm, mm. that Abdu'l-Bahá should be referred to as an ambassador because Abdul means servant as well. Mm -hmm, He's mm -hmm. the servant of Bahá. Mm -hmm. But then I started thinking about what is an ambassador. And you think of an ambassador as someone who's already distinguished for their public service. They're appointed to be the presence of a country in another land. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like Abdu'l-Bahá was this ambassador for the kingdom of God for the world. He was the ambassador to humanity. And also the ambassador is, if you're stranded in another country or you are you get into trouble in another country, the embassy is the place you go to, mm. to mm. get help, mm -hmm. your own embassy. So just this figure of Abdu'l-Bahá as an ambassador, mm. someone that everyone could turn to, mm. but who was also a representative, just seemed to be very profound. And even in Baha'u'llah's lifetime, Abdu'l-Bahá was the ambassador to Baha'u'llah. He was so careful that Baha'u'llah was not bothered by people, mm. that mm. Baha'u'llah was protected from the world, mm. that Abdu'l-Bahá was really the public face of Baha'u'llah all through that period in Akka. Yeah. If they had to go to the authorities to demand something or to ask for some rights or get some kind of sure. uh, help, it was Abdul Baha who went. And so he was very much concerned about protecting Baha'u'llah, allowing Baha'u'llah to get on with 
revealing the sacred tablets and he was the one that was interacting with the world so i just thought it was a interesting title and one that hadn't been used before as well yeah, on no, it's, a book about it's Abdu'l-Baha. incredibly apt uh, very moving there's another chapter of abdul baha's life that you you briefly mentioned and i realized like i don't know anything of abdul baha in their stay in baghdad is there anything you can tell me about that time period well abdul baha was very young when they arrived in baghdad Baha'u'llah had been in the CHR prison. He was banished out of Iran. And so Abdul Baha would have only been about nine or 10 at the time. And so he was a very young boy, but he was obviously already very devoted to his father. And then there's this period of more than two years when Baha'u'llah goes off into the mountains in Suleimaniyeh, mm -hmm. as all the prophets have done in the past to prepare himself for his mission because he'd had the revelation in the CHR mm -hmm. and one gets the sense of Abdul Baha being very distraught as a young boy because he adored Baha'u'llah and suddenly they wake up one day Baha'u'llah had gone and they had no news of him they had nowhere to turn they didn't know where he was mm -hmm. and it was a full two years or so before someone heard of this dervish living up in the mountains in a cave and when they heard about him, they thought, that sounds like Baha'u'llah. So mm -hmm. they sent someone to beg him to come back. Mm -hmm. But during that time, Abdul Baha was really just immersed in studying, at that time, the writings of the Bab and developing those capacities that we know uh, for him. And um, there's an account, for example, it says, that during this time, Abdul Baha was taken by his uncle, Baha'u'llah's brother, Mirza Musa, to some of the meetings of the friends. There he spoke to them with a marvelous eloquence. Even at that early age of 11 or 12, yeah. the friends wondered at his wisdom and the beauty of his person, which equaled that of his mind. But then it says he prayed without ceasing for the return of Baha'u'llah. He would sometimes spend a whole night through praying a certain prayer. And then one day after a night so spent, they found a clue. Very soon, the beloved one returned. That's an account by Abdul Baha's own wife, Munireh Khanum. Mm, mm. So you get that sense of, and the joy, you get that sense of the joy that Abdul Baha felt when Baha'u'llah returned. But very soon after that, he obviously was learning all the time from Baha'u'llah. Mm. And that culminates after 10 years in the Garden of Rezvan, mm. where Baha'u'llah announces his mission publicly for the first time. And then they are banished further to Constantinople and Adrianople. And there are lovely stories of Abdul Baha accompanying the family, looking after the family, making sure everyone's okay on the journey. Mm -hmm. And they said he cared so much for people that he couldn't take any time to rest for himself or sleep. Mm -hmm. So often he would ride ahead very fast on his horse and go some distance and then have a nap <laughs> and wait for the others to catch <laughs> up. So the only time he could actually get any sleep was to do it that way. Mm -hmm. And he really, again, at that point, was protecting Baha'u'llah, protecting the family, looking after everyone and making sure that everyone's needs were served before his own. And then that comes into focus even more when they're in Adrianople because he's actually dealing with officials and governors and people like that mm -hmm. and beginning to publicly represent Baha'u'llah and the faith. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, what a bounty this book is in this really sacred year, Ambassador to Humanity, Rob Weinberg. Uh, pick up a copy. There's my plug. But now, who are you, Rob? I don't know you. Um, how did you become a Baha'i? Give me a little bit on your life story. Well, I feel very privileged for the fact that my parents found the Baha'i faith um, some years before I was born. Both my parents are from Jewish background. My father grew up in South Africa, my mother grew up in London. And independently, they both came across the Baha'i faith. That's another story, wonderful story. But shortly after my father arrived in London, he went to a meeting at the Baha'i Centre in London and my mother had been attending those meetings for a few years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And her parents thought 
she was crazy to go to these Baha'i meetings. Right. And then this nice Jewish boy turns up on the doorstep mm-hmm. and she thinks, ah, oh, here's someone I can introduce to my parents to show them that I'm not so crazy <laughs> after all. So they met actually at the Baha'i Centre mm-hmm. in London mm-hmm. at that time. So I grew up uh, in the faith and I always... See, if you want to meet a nice Jewish partner, just go to, <laughs> go to a Baha'i, Baha'i meeting. meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the thing is, like you were saying about the faith as you were growing up, you know, we lived in a relatively small community and there wasn't much going on other than having the feasts and holy days. And I knew that my parents were on the local assembly and so on. And then I read a book by Roger White, who was a wonderful writer, mm-hmm. Baha'i, who served at the Baha'i World Center in Israel poet. and a poet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he wrote a novel called A Sudden Music, and it's set in Paris uh, in the early days of the 20th century. It's about an American girl in Paris, and she's mixing with this first Baha'i community in Paris Mm. at that time, around the time of Abdu'l Baha's visit. And I grew up loving art, loving music, loving the arts. And something about that book really just captivated me. It was really the first Baha'i book that I read properly. Mm -hmm. And it was a novel, but based in historical fact. And I suddenly felt that I wanted to know everything about Abdul Baha. This is going back to the age of 17, 18. And Roger puts Juliet Thompson as a character in A Sudden Music. Mm -hmm. So then the next book I read was The Diary of Juliet Thompson. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't get enough of reading the history of the faith and the biographies of the early believers. Mm. And I was also just very interested having studied, I was studying art, I was studying music, that so many of the early Baha'is in Paris, especially, were mixing in those circles where some of the, the most prominent modernist writers, poets, musicians, artists were mixing. Actually, I read your article on this. I found it absolutely fascinating. Abdu'l-Bahá and his bumping up against, and early Baha'is bumping up against the modernist art movement. It was it was incredible. This was for the Baha'i World, is that correct? The Baha'i World website, yes. And actually, uh, you mentioned Kathy Hoganson there. She's working on a biography of Horace Holly, mm-hmm. who uh, is well known to Baha'is as mainly an administrator of the faith. Mm -hmm. He served on the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States for many years. But Horace Holly at that time was in Paris running an art gallery. And it's extraordinary, actually, when you delve into it, and I hope this is in Kathy's book. I'm sure she's found out a lot more than we know already. But many of the prominent modern artists of that time were mixing with Horace Holly. I actually found a book. This was something else that triggered my interest there was a group of painters called the Scottish Colorists, mm. and they were Scottish artists who were inspired by modernism. Mm-hmm. They went to Paris and they painted these very vibrant, like Matisse, very bright, brightly colored pictures. And I had a book on Scottish Colorists, and in it, it said at this time, the Scottish Colorists started introducing Oriental motifs and themes into their paintings because of their interest in the Baha'i faith. (laughs) And I was like, where did that come from? I had no idea. And then doing a little digging around, I found out that they were all exhibited by Horace Holly in his gallery. I don't know much more than that, but it sort of set me on this kind of quest to really know more about the modernist artists and musicians and writers that also came into contact with the faith. And I think it's very much the spirit of the age. You know, I think they... They caught something uh, of that spirit that came with the new revelation. Mm. And part of modernism was to break the rules, was to rebel against the past, to be dissatisfied with convention and to experiment Mm. and try new things. It's kind of adolescent behavior, but it's one that uh, set art and music and theater and literature and all on its course throughout the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I've always been keen to sort of connect the faith and the teachings of the faith with 
art and music. And that's sort of stayed with me, as you can see, after my teenage years for many years since, many mm, decades. Mm. But I went to university, I studied visual art and media, film, photography and music. And while I was studying, doing my bachelor's degree, the BBC local radio station across the road from the university campus had a youth program on Sunday nights called Turn It Up. And it was a program where young people went along and volunteered and basically put together, produced, presented the program. So I got involved it with sounds, that. It sounds like it sounds like an episode of Alan Partridge. Like. <laughs> well, there are plenty of presenters like Alan Partridge. <laughs> Alan Partridge is based on most of those kinds of presenters. Uh-huh. And um, yeah, so I got involved in radio and I started uh, doing interviews and reviewing books and films and presenting. And so when I finished my degree, I thought, I don't really want to be a starving artist or a musician, but I did enjoy radio. So I stayed in radio and I've been in radio ever since. I Mm -hmm. worked in the BBC for about four or five years. And then a national radio station began in 1992 called Classic FM, which was the first national commercial radio station in the UK. And strangely enough, it was a classical music station. But Mm. the whole premise of Classic FM was that it would be presented in a very popular, friendly, non-intellectual way that there was all this music, thousand years of beautiful music, and no one was hearing it because it was considered to be the sort of preserve of right. intellectuals or, you know, privileged yeah, classes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they put together this proposal for a radio station. They said they would do this, and no one thought it would work. And within six months, they had two million listeners. It was just a mm. phenomenal success, still going today, 29 mm-hmm. years later. And um, I spent 20 years at Classic FM and it was really a phenomenal time because it was, first of all, it was exciting to be part of that kind of experiment, if you like, but Mm -hmm. we were able to do things that we wouldn't have come close to at the BBC because it's such a huge organisation. So there I am sitting in a room with Paul McCartney or Luciano Pavarotti or, you know, going to Hong Kong and broadcasting shows for a week from Hong Kong or, Mm. you know, producing live concert of the three tenors at Wembley Stadium or you name it, everybody, every famous actor, writer, musician, dancer that there is Mm -hmm. came through the doors, you know, and I'm sat sat in the same room as them working on programs with them. And Mm -hmm. uh, actually one thing I wanted to say, it's my proudest moment was our studios in London were next to Jim Henson's Creature Shop. And I used to walk past there every day thinking, you know, I'd love to have a look in there one day. And um, then our boss one Christmas said, I want some good ideas for Christmas shows. So I thought, wouldn't it be a good idea if we got Kermit the Frog to present one of our shows? (laughs) So I arranged this meeting with the people inside Jim Henson's Creature Shop, finally got inside. And they were bringing out Muppet Treasure Island, I think, at that point. So they wanted obviously the publicity. So I said, do you think we could get Kermit the Frog to present a show on Classic FM? And it was so funny because they were like, well, you know, Kermit's an international star. He doesn't just do any old radio station. We'll have to ask him. (laughs) And they, all the time, they, they just referred to Kermit the Frog. It was like no reference to anyone behind the scenes, you know, Mm -hmm. um, so they approach Kermit lives in Seattle, they told me, and he has his own studio. So if you write a script, we'll can send it to Kermit and he'll record it and send in, it back. <laughs> <laughs> so that's fantastic. So, yeah, so I, we had an app. maybe we should get Kermit the Frog to host Baha'i Blog. <laughs> hey, Kermit the Frog here. Um, Rob Weinberg, yay! That's very good. Pretty good. It wasn't new, was it? <laughs> No, I've, I've, I've been working on that since my adolescence, uh, since my turbulent adolescence. Yeah. So, um, um, so, you know, you know, whether it was, like I say, Paul McCartney or Pavarotti or Kermit the Frog, you know, those were really great times. Mm. And um, then I've stayed 
working in radio. And then there's been this whole phenomenon of podcasts in the last few years. And yeah. most recently, I've been working with a quite famous TV historian called Dan Snow, who does a lot of history programs on British television. And he set up his own podcast called History Hit, which is really successful, several million listeners, a mm. daily podcast he does. And, wow. Um, a day how do you do a daily podcast? Well, before lockdown, we would do five or six in a day. We'd have a little room in the centre of London and book the guests and they'd come in and Dan would talk to them for an hour and then they'd go out and the next one would come in. And then you'd have all your podcasts for the week. Um, but since lockdown and the rise of Zoom, it's become even easier because he can now talk to historians and writers all over the world and mm. just do it from his own home. So right. we're constantly... Um, reflecting current affairs, current events, and, you know, interesting stories that have made history. And mm. now History Hits expanded to include lots of other strands. So I'm now producing a show called Not Just the Tudors, which is with another wonderful historian called Susanna Lipscomb. And she's a Tudor specialist, but the show is Not Just the Tudors. And it's so varied. I mean, I'm just editing now a podcast about the arrival of coffee and tobacco in Britain <laughs> in the Tudor times. <laughs> and last week it was about witch trials and the week before it was about teenage werewolves trials. And then it was about, you know, some mad king of Spain. And, you know, there's just so much going on. So it's quite interesting. I'm learning a lot. But I think mm -hmm. my first, mm -hmm. I think my passion for history now emerged actually from my passion for Baha'i history. Oh, because wow. I always yeah. was interested in that period when Abdul Baha was traveling and the people that he met. And yep. now I'm finding that actually it was a very small world, you know, all these people were connected and you can really sort of find some very interesting connections and threads between all these different people. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's a bit about me. But you took your knowledge of media and worked for many years in the Office of Public Information uh, in Haifa. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I had the great privilege of being invited to go and serve in the Office of Public Information in 2009. And it was really a wonderful experience. I always said that you never knew from day to day what was going to happen, mm. but I was responsible for the international websites of the faith, uh, Baha'i.org. And you'll know that in the last decade or so, they've really developed this family of international websites. So I was very involved mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing I enjoyed most about it was... The Baha'i.org Baha website and series of websites is really uh, fantastic. I think it's just top-notch and beautifully presented and just classy and moving and aesthetically pleasing and I'm, I'm very proud of it not that i had anything to do with it but <laughs> well, we, when i direct people there i feel a, a great pride around it well you know every word of that website is approved by the universal house of justice because wow. really it is the definitive authoritative official baha'i site so mm -hmm. i had that privilege of being able to work so closely with the house of justice members on the site and I learned so much from that. One of the great joys of serving at the World Center was being responsible for looking after the guests that came to visit. And you know, we don't teach in the Holy Land, but I was talking about the faith every single day with visitors that were coming. Mm. And one particular memory I have is when Gene Simmons of KISS came to visit the Baha'i World Center. <laughs> And we were told that Gene Simmons was making a, he was doing a show called Gene Simmons Family Jewels. Do you remember that? It was, it was kind okay. of like the Osbournes, <laughs> but Gene Simmons, his wife and his kids were sort of traveling and he was actually born in Haifa. Who knew? So we uh, were That's told. That's right. I knew he was Jewish, but I, I'd forgotten yeah, that. And but yeah, I, yeah. He left when he was four years old. So we were told that Gene Simmons was going to come. And it was my job to show him around and welcome him. But they were keeping it sort of top secret. They didn't want uh, lots of people to know about it, his people. So I went up to the top of Mount Carmel, Terrace 19, 
about seven in the morning and the film crew was there and all the guys were there with all the equipment setting up and so on. And I said, are you with Gene Simmons? And they all kind of looked stony faced because they'd been sworn to secrecy. <laughs> and I said, it's okay. I know about it. I'm looking after him on this visit. So they told me, and then they said, could you make sure talk about reality TV? They said, can you make sure that, there aren't any other people in the gardens when he's visiting. <laughs> so these coachloads of tourists were turning up. And there was this little lovely Nepalese security guard youth who was trying to hold back all of these people from going onto the terraces and going into the gardens. And then, of course, when Gene Simmons arrived in his big car with his wife, he got out the car and he had a crowd waiting for him which was right, not the right. idea and he's waving he's saying shalom everybody shalom and um we took him on the uh, terraces and he was there for that day and then the other person i remember is the actor paul giamatti mm -hmm. and he was in town for the high for film festival and we had a wonderful uh visit with him and uh, he expressed such an interest in the story of the barb and we took him around the exhibition and he saw the picture of Sam Khan, who was the leader of the regiment that was asked to execute the Barb. And he said, who's that guy? And I was explaining, he said, if you ever make a film about the Barb, he's the one I'm going to play. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we had just so many different people. One day, Harry Connick Jr. came the next day, you know, we had a film crew from Thailand, then you know, a German theological magazine rang up and said, could we have an interview about the significance of the prophet Elijah? And you never knew from day to day what was going to happen. Right, um, right. But it was, yeah, it was a very special time. And uh, yeah, I feel very privileged to have been able to do that. Amazing. That must have been incredible. And so you've got all this podcast work in front of you and radio work, but any other books, any other ideas for books, anything you can tease well, you know, whenever you're researching one thing, someone comes to light and you think, oh, I'd really like to research that person. I'd really like to write about that person. And I was able to do a book about Ethel Rosenberg, who was the first British Baha'i um, mm. some years ago. And then I worked for 12, 13 years on a biography of Lady Blomfield, which came out mm. some, uh, mm -hmm. about seven or eight years ago. Um, so I think those kinds of books... Uh, they take a lot of research and a lot of time and a lot of work. So I'm not mm. sure until the day I retire whether I'm going to be able to do anything along those lines if I ever retire. But um, I think this theme of Abdul Baha's encounter with modernists is something that I would like to delve more into. I think mm. there's a lot more to be found out and said about that period and the people that Abdul Baha met. And it's just so interesting that, you know, it would be wonderful. I don't know if we'd ever be able to find any account by Picasso, for example, where he says, mm. you know, the Baha'i teachings meant this to me, or, you know, I encountered Horace Holly and he told me this. And I don't think that's, right. that's likely to happen. But all of these people were connected, you know, and you can see these people mixing. And of course, the... American community, there was a very large American community in Paris at that time. It, Paris was the place mm -hmm. you went if you were studying mm -hmm. art or architecture or opera or whatever. So, and it was a salon culture. So these people were opening their homes and having all these people around to, uh, mm -hmm. to share their ideas and thoughts. And France, Paris particularly has that tradition of kind of salons. So they all knew each other. And I just think it's very interesting to position the Baha'i community, the first Baha'i community in Europe, within the context of that world of salon mm -hmm. culture and American artists and intellectuals. So that's something that I'd really love to develop more, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, I haven't got round to formally beginning a writing project on that. That essay in the Baha'i World website was a kind of first stab at that. Okay. Okay, well, looks like you've committed right here and now to that next book. You've planted your flag. We are looking forward to reading that book. The temple is built. In, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that's that sounds really exciting. Rob, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you today. 
Thank you for your book, Ambassador to Humanity. What a tremendous gift. And to hear more about your your life and your journey was really inspiring. Any last thoughts you want to leave us with on this centenary of Abdu'l-Bahá's passing? I think the House of Justice said it when they said that this year would be a year of profound reflection on Abdu'l-Bahá and the covenant of which he was a center. And I think that's a kind of call perhaps to really think about it every day. It's not a case of, oh, we need to have a big event in November when it's the actual right. centenary, but it's a mm. year of profound reflection mm. and thinking every day about what Abdu'l-Bahá brought to the world, what the example was that he set. And, you know, I think if all of us just do one of the things, the smallest of things that Abdu'l-Bahá did, you know, we can, mm. we can actually make a real impact on our communities and our societies. So mm. it's exciting already now to see Baha'i musicians and artists and children's class teachers and junior youth animators who are mm. already thinking, you know, about how can we bring Abdu'l-Bahá into our conversations this year? When I was thinking about it in my own community, I was thinking, what what is it that Abdu'l-Bahá would really like to see? You know, he probably mm. wouldn't want something which is all about him praising him. But wherever Abdu'l-Bahá went, he loved to see people of different backgrounds and nationalities mixing together and meeting each other. And mm. I thought, is there something that we could do locally where we really make an effort to bring the people of this town together and just bring them all into one space where for right. for a day at least they meet each other, you know, and they yeah. recognize their unity and celebrate their diversity and so on. So that's something that my local community is now talking about doing locally because we've got a very multicultural community here. There's a lot of Indian, Pakistani, Caribbean, Polish, all sorts of people live in this mm. town. And I've never seen... I hardly ever see the mixing within the center of the town, let alone, you know, in the same room or in the same place. So right. I thought maybe that's something that would bring Abdu'l-Bahá some happiness would be just that effort to bring those people together and to start mm. having conversations with each other. That's a beautiful idea. That is, that's a beautiful sentiment. Thank you so much, Rob. What a, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on Baha'i Blogcast. This has been a great conversation as I knew it would be. And Really excited to to check out your book and hope our paths cross again. Thank you so much. It's been lovely. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much and good night. <laughs>